We will uh, have two days uh, of panels, uh, starting with a, a small presentation talk by one of our guests. Today it will be a presentation um, about uh, more prehistory uh, of blockchain art and NFTs. So we go uh, a bit more into depth into from where uh, is it all coming. So today we have like uh, Pierre-Yves de Seif, uh, who is an art critic and curator. Uh, we have Paolo Walder, who is also a curator. And we have uh, Joanne Heemskerk, uh, who is an artist, uh, part uh, also uh, of uh, Jody. So um, maybe we can just introduce our guests. Uh, they can introduce themselves a little bit more than myself. Yes. <laughs> Doesn't work? Yes, it does. Hello, so I'm Pierre-Yves Dosev. I'm an art historian. Uh, after studying um, history of art, I also did a major in uh, computer science applied to history of art. And as I always say, was to um, reassure my parents because they saw me studying history of art, which means, you know, getting no job. So uh, let's go and study um, computer science a bit. And so I've always been very interested into the interaction between uh, art, contemporary art and, uh, and technology. Um, I'm a conservator at the Royal Museum of Fine Arts of Brussels here, where I'm in charge of the contemporary art collection. And uh, I also teach a class in uh, La Cambre, um, where I teach a class on, uh, uh, yes, media art, media art based mo mostly. Uh, hi, I'm Paul Welder. I'm uh, an art historian also. And uh, I, <coughs> I studied art history and then I did my PhD on the relationships between uh, the contemporary art market and uh, new media. And from that then I, I wrote a, a book about collecting uh, digital art. And uh, I have also curated several exhibitions of uh, digital art uh, with the intention of gradually introducing uh, digital art into the contemporary art field, which I think it's where it belongs. And uh, lately now I am a senior curator at NEO, which is an online uh, platform and uh, for uh, the dissemination, uh, preservation, and display of video and digital art. Hey, I'm Joan Heemskerk. Uh, I'm an artist. Um, actually, I started as a photographer, and then suddenly with Photoshop One, I entered the domain of digital art, uh, which through making uh, CD-ROMs ended up making websites, uh, performances, uh, video art, game art, uh, whatever you like, and uh, recently also made an NFT. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's about it. Thank you, Joanna. Briefly, once again, when we talk about NFT, what are we talking about? What are we not talking about? This is the most one of the most common representation really of an NFT crypto art, like a, a piece of artwork within the blockchain. This is really the way we represent it, but actually it's a bit more uh, complicated than this. So let's take the one where it all started with people and this uh, crazy auction at Christie's where the, these art pieces were sold for more than uh, 40,000 uh, ether, which was at the time, you know, roughly, yes. 60 million USD, but what's a million anyway? Um, so uh, I was really interested by the sale because at the time I was already talking about NFTs to my, uh, my students and then this came happen. And actually this was the time I was just watching the auction, just wondering what was going on. So as I said, it's uh, just, just a few words again. All the information that you see on the top of the screen were provided by Christie, so you know exactly the number of the token, you have the wallet address, you have the smart contract address, you have everything, which links you to the smart contract page and which provides you with an uh, IPF address. So what is the uh, IPFS address? Interplanetary file system. It's really important to um, get this concept. This is where the, the, the file created by people actually is. You have the internet on one side, and then you have this protocol, which is like a, a file sharing system, like a peer-to-peer -peer system, which allows you to upload a file, and the file will exist on the uh, IPFS. 
it's very important to understand that there is no uh, no way if you store the file of people on a dot com uh, website for instance there is no way that you can ensure that if it remains on that dot com it will remain forever when it lives on the uh, IPFS, potentially, as long as there will be at least one copy, it will be possible to uh, find it again. Uh, so from the smart contract, we get to this page, and this page provides you with two links. One link that goes to a low definition image of what people created, and the other one that directs you to the actual file. We can go to the next one. Okay, so this is it. So you have the address, you have everything you need, and you can actually download the file. You can download the file and you can check that this is the actual file, which is really the most important thing, because in the smart contract, you provide it with a hash, which is the cryptographic key of the artwork, and that cryptographic key is also within the metadata of the file, which means that if you download the file, you can compare and you can make sure that the two match. This is the actual file, which means that if I download the file, if I change just one pixel and upload it again on the IPFS and name it the 5,000 first days like people did, well, there is no way that you can take one for the other because if you change anything in the file, it will be exactly, I mean, it, it will change completely between the, uh, 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 the, uh, the NFT and the file itself. So this is the scheme, the basic scheme really. So you buy the NFT by Beeple, which links you to the IPFS item, which leads you in the end to the file. So yes, you can download, you can copy a file that is linked to an NFT. But the file itself does not live on the blockchain, which is really important because the blockchain was not designed for it, actually. For, for practical reason, it would be almost impossible, would be way too expensive to have a huge file, like the file designed by people, on the blockchain. So this is basically how it works. The only solution, actually, if you wanted to be the owner of your JPEG or file or whatever it is that it is linked to your NFT, would be to proceed like Fred Forrest did already in 1996. It was the very first time that an artist was selling a piece of art that was designed only for the internet. It was an image, and the only image I have of that image is the one that you see on the screen with this black square, because nobody was supposed to see it apart from the two owners who actually bought the piece by Fred Forrest in an auction. So what Fred Forrest did actually, he put the file on a server and he auctioned the certificate with a code and the owners could access the server and they could enjoy their piece of art. So this is the difference between the NFT where actually you own the certificate but the file itself lives on the internet and you can see it, you can share it, and yes, other people can download it, it's true. Or the other way would be to act this way. Um, it's important to <laughs> explain that this is a strange story because actually the people who bought the piece, they had a startup and then the startup went bankrupt. And when it went bankrupt, well, all the uh, computer science equipment, all the technical equipment was seized. And yes, there was the server with the artwork that was on the server. So it's gone, it's gone forever. This is why I once again underline the fact that it's important when you buy an NFT that the file link to the NFT is not on a dot .com, whatever, because if the dot .com goes bankrupt or if the dot .com change from dot .com to dot .org, the link between the NFT and the file is lost too. So this is a concept I think important to underline. So yes, it brings us to a uh, very nice memes. I really like this one. So you have the golem. Let's look at the, the precious. And yes, uh, we explain him. No, you don't own the precious. Actually, you just have your name in an unlisted database. This one I really like very much too. And the NFT creators, when you right click and save images, oh, you can do this to me. Of course you can. Doesn't matter. It's not the coin. I mean, it's not the point. It's not the question. The question is, you own the certificate. You own the NFT. 
This was designed already in 2014. This is really the very first time that an NFT was sold, was sold for $5, no, $10, was resold recently for $1 million. Well, that's the way it goes. And um, two, it was an artist actually, Kevin McCoy, with uh, Anil Dash, who's uh, more of an uh, engineer, who designed this within the course of a night. And their idea was just to find a solution to the fact that all these digital artists that they were uh, working with could not find a way to sell their art. So they came with the idea to merge the concept of the blockchain with the, uh, the, the idea of the, the digital art. So this is how they designed it, actually. And recently, Anil Dash was saying it's really strange because we designed this over a night in 2014. It's far from being perfect. You know, we, we, we need to rethink it. And he looks and he says, eight years later, it is still designed the same way. So maybe it was not that bad, actually. Maybe, actually, the system definitely uh, uh, works. But they were not the only ones trying to find a way uh, to um, allow artists to make money by selling their, their pieces of, uh, uh, of, of digital art. Another example that I really like very much is uh, Rafael Rosendahl, who's, very, uh, who's still working a lot today, and of course he turned, like most of these artists, to NFTs too. And he was the first to design a contract uh, in 2016 that was really inspired by the contract design for conceptual artists in the late 1960s, early 1970s. And um, what uh, Rafael uh, Rosendahl designed is a contract to be signed by the artist and by the buyer. Um, and in that contract, that is something very specific to it, the buyer uh, uh, agrees that every year or every three years he will renew the domain name where the artwork by Rafael Rosendahl is being hosted. This is an example of a work by Rafael Rosendahl. So if we go to uh, see this, uh, this artwork. So this is the artwork by Rafael Rosendahl. Maybe you cannot see it actually in the, uh, uh, on the top, but actually you can see the name of the owner. If you see it on the full screen, actually, within the name of the, the, the file is the name of the, of the owner. So it's called uh, electricboogiewoogie.com, which is the uh, domain name that you have to renew every year if you buy this piece from the, the current owner and you agree by contract. You know, if, if you don't, then the, the, the artist uh, can, can tell you, you know, okay, so I have to, to take the, the, the work back. And, which is really nice, I think, the name of the owner is also put into the uh, website itself. So this is the contract I was mentioning about, ZZ Club, um, who designed this for conceptual artists in 1971. Uh, to sell a piece like this, uh, a piece by Lawrence Weiner. So you can own the, the, the piece by Lawrence Weiner, you can uh, put it on your wall, and if I come to your, your house and I see the piece of work by, by Lawrence Weiner, I say, wow, this would really look good in my kitchen, and I decide to do it. Well, there is nothing the artist can prevent me to do so. I, I, I discussed this with Lawrence Weiner, and he told me, yes, you can do it, of course. You can tattoo it on your skin if you want. It will still be a piece of art, but it won't be a piece of art by Lawrence Weiner, which is the whole difference. You need to have the certificate, and the certificate is a piece of paper. Why not turn it into an NFT? Because it will live on the blockchain, and it will be impossible to, uh, to delete it. Around uh, 2014, so at the same time that uh, the first NFT crypto art was designed, other artists who were thinking about creating certificate too, inspired also by the certificate from the 1960s, like Ria Myers, but I will come back to her later. And this is, for instance, one thing she did, a piece of art that I really like very much from 2014. It's really a piece of Ethereum, Ethereum uh, artwork, it's really an NFT, and within the contract, remember what, what, what we saw, we have, the, 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 we have the, the token ID, then we have the smart contract, and within the smart contract, actually she put something that allows you to define this NFT as a piece of art, this contract is art, or this contract is not art, it's yours to decide. Once you've decided, it will remain that way unless you sell it to someone else and that person decides that no, this piece, no, no, th this, is not, this is not art, this is just a contract. So uh, within the NFT, within the contract, you can change the nature, the very nature of the work. It's completely conceptual and it really 
I think, expresses very well how these artists are being inspired by everything that was already designed in the 1960s and 1970s. So yes, it's not coming from nowhere. It's really a reflection about art and you know what is art, what is not art. Before everyone started talking about people and, and, and all these millions, you had artist uh, Sarah Meoas. She is a photographer and she heard about the NFT, she heard about the, the blockchain, and she, she designed her own um, uh, cri cryptocurrency, which uh, she named Bitcoin. Love the word, of course, love the name. And the Bitcoin, actually, she would sell to her collectors. One Bitcoin is $100, but the Bitcoin equal, uh, equals uh, 25 squares, uh, centimeters, of one of her photography. Which means that in this case, it is not the value of the Bitcoin that matters, it's the value of the photography. Because if you buy the photography for, let's say, $1,000, and two years, three years later, you know, she's the next big hit, and your photography is now worth a million, well, you know, the, bitch, the Bitcoin is worth more, too. So she inverts the, the, the connection between the NFT, the cryptocurrency, and the physical art world. This connection between NFT and, and, and physical work is really interesting because it took a while before, uh, you know, houses like Christie's or even, you know, art collectors decided to buy only digital art, only NFTs. For a while, there was this connection between the NFT and uh, the physical artwork. This is an example. This was sold by Christie's before people, right before people, just one year. Nobody really talked about it, even though it was a very huge event because it was the first time that they were actually selling an NFT. But there was something linked to it, which was a sculpture. Ben Gentili actually designed 40 different discs on which he engraved the code of the Bitcoin. And he chose one of the 40 discs. The, name, the, the number 21, why 21? Because 21, 21 million, that is the, name of the, the, the number of Bitcoins, there will be no more than 21 million Bitcoins. And he turned that disk number 21 into, uh, um, uh, into an NFT, and this is the NFT. So the, what is the NFT? What is the, the, the crypto art that is related to this NFT? It's a picture, of course. Well, you know, it's a picture of block 21. It's like a foreman uh, of, uh, yes, in, in, in memory of the founder of the, the, the blockchain Bitcoin, and you have the code on it, and it looks like, you know, an ancient coin, a, a Chinese coin, maybe it looks like, of course, I mean, there are lots of connections you, you can make. But what is really interesting about the piece is that it changes. It changes according to the, the, the daytime. Uh, if you see, no, maybe you don't see it, but current set time zone is GMT, and actually you see it during daylight. But if you come later on and, and check the, uh, the, the, the NFT again, then it will be uh, completely dark because it will be during the night. So that's really interesting because it adds a little something to the um, uh, crypto asset linked to the NFT, which is the ability to change. We already saw it with Rhea Myers, you know, the fact that you can decide, okay, this is art, this is not art. I like this one very much too. Uh, th this idea to, um, to, to insert a change, you know, something that is, that you don't really have control over, of course came to mind of Beeple before he did the big sale uh, uh, at Christie's uh, for uh, you know, seven uh, uh, million dollars. This was actually designed right before the American election. You know, who is going to win? Is it going to be Biden? Is it going to be Trump? And Beeple designed uh, this, um, uh, uh, this piece of art. He sold it a pretty good price too, uh, really. But what is really interesting is that the buyer had, yes, if you can leave, yeah, okay, right. And so what, what we see here, of course, it's Donald Trump, you know, on a you know, loser, you know, he's been tagged, you know, he lost the election. But actually the buyer, when he bought the piece, didn't know what he was getting. Because people told him, I don't know who's going to buy, but just uh, who's going to win the election. But there are two versions of this NFT. One, you have Trump that is dancing, you know, yes, I won, you know, the, the triumphal uh, 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 Donald Trump. The other one, if he loses, will be this one. And the buyer bought the piece and he didn't know, you know. And he had to wait until the result of the American election to see that this is actually what he bought, you know. Again, uh, one last example of a connection between uh, uh, NFT and, uh, uh, and, and physical artwork, it's Kevin Abosch. Um, Kevin Abosch, maybe you don't know 
him, maybe you've heard of him, but you don't know him, but he was the one who's, who, who made a big, big hit selling a, a picture of a potato. You know, he sold, a, it was a beautiful potato, it was a beautiful picture, and that picture happened to be sold for $1 million. And nobody really knew Kevin Abosch before, even though, you know, you know he was making beautiful uh, pictures of uh, celebrities, but yeah. this uh, this time he sold that, that 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 picture, and it came to his mind that he was wondering what makes the you know the value of art, and of course because this NFT market was coming up, he decided to do something too, and what he did was to create his own. Uh, cryptocurrency that he, he called I am a coin and what he did was to create uh, uh, he, he created 10, 10 million of these coins called I am a coin that he put on on, on the blockchain but what he did was to uh, print uh, uh, with his own blood uh, the, the, the wallet address of these uh, of this uh, crypto cryptocurrency and he can sell them to to the collectors so the collectors they can own um, his cryptocurrency, the NFT really, but they can also own a piece of paper, a work on paper, which is the physical artwork. And um, yes, this is an installation that he showed in Paris, in, in, in Jeux de Paume. He wants to remind us that actually, there is an average of four million Bitcoins that should be lost forever because you know wallets were lost, because we've all heard these uh, horrific stories of these people having their uh, private uh, uh, key on the, uh, on, on the laptop, then the laptop was stolen or the laptop was thrown away, and you had this guy you know, searching in a pile of garbage trying to find his hard disk because he knew that he had bitcoins on the hard disk, things like that. Well, yes, it happened, and it will happen again, of course. And um, what he did using his uh, cryptocurrency, that he, he put them on the blockchain, Chain and then he lost the addresses. So his artworks, they, they live somewhere on the blockchain, but there is no way he can find them back. And he printed actually the, the, the addresses on these big bags saying, okay, maybe inside you have the private keys They would allow you to retrieve the cryptocurrency, but I don't know where they are. I destroy them, so they live on the blockchain, but I don't know where they are. And one last example, which is really interesting because we're talking here about a monument of contemporary art, we're talking about Ai Weiwei. Um, I'm, what I'm really interested into is the, the, the way contemporary art and digital art may merge, and I think that the NFT is a good example. Kevin Abosch and Ai Weiwei design a, a project called Priceless. What is Priceless? Actually, it's two tokens that they design for the Ethereum blockchain. One token, two of them, they are, all of them are called priceless. One can be divided up to 18 decimals, I, I think, so it can be divided into m millions of pieces, really, and can be sold away, so you buy a piece of art from the blockchain that was designed by uh, Kevin Abosch. What you buy is theirs, it's a, it's a piece of a priceless. And the other token, priceless, it will remain on the blockchain, will be never sold. And what he wants to uh, refer to is these priceless moments, as he called them, uh, shared with Ai Weiwei, like drinking tea, like, you know, talking about the art market, like, you know, uh, g going to a garden in, in Berlin, things like that. So really meta, uh, metaphorical uh, work, uh, which I think is also a nice way to connect between the digital uh, world and the physical world. Yes, and a good example too, because he, he had an exhibition uh, very uh, very uh, early in uh, in Brussels, Neil Belufa. What he does is the next step. He provides the owner of the NFT with a little extra because I told you about Beeple, the way you can download uh, the, the file. But the next step now is to insert a little more. And when you buy an NFT that was designed by Neil Belufa, the owner he gets something. He, he gets something more. He gets a video, a video that no one can, no one else can see because it's really into the. Uh, uh, the NFT. Another example, you've all heard of the CryptoPunks, of course, they make the big hit, you know, by once again, the CryptoPunk, well, you can copy it, you can own it, but now if you, the next generation of CryptoPunks, they're called MeBits, and when you buy the MeBits, as the owner of the NFT, you get a little something more too, you get the ability to animate your MeBits. So they're already thinking about the metaverse, you know, they're, so, they're thinking about uh, 3D uh, environments, so 
by the NFT, by the MeBit. Okay, you have the picture, but you also have, and you only have the ability to insert him into the metaverse, into a 3D uh, environment. I'm looking for not being too long. Another good example, um, he made big news uh, recently. He, he's called Pac, and um, more than 200 uh, people, I think, bought a piece of a very, very complex structure. Actually, you can decide to buy pieces of a potentially enormous NFT, a potentially enormous uh, piece of crypto art. So you buy pieces, other one buy pieces, but people buy from other people and slowly but surely they gather all these pieces together and maybe, potentially actually, they could in the end recreate the idea of this very complex mathematical uh, structure that was designed by PAC. So that's also something, you own, you own a piece of a, a, a crypto art asset, but actually you need to all, all of them, which is of course the best way to uh, have collectors, you know, investing into your artwork, you can understand. But it's interesting because you also find it in the physical art world, you know, we all hear about, well, you know, how to buy a Jean-Michel Basquiat today. Well, you can buy pieces of Jean-Michel Basquiat. You know, this is coming up too. People are wondering if maybe it might be an option to buy, uh, to, to, to share actually the, the, uh, the, the property of, uh, of a big piece of contemporary art. We're talking always about money because it's all about big money. That's right. Once again, let's not forget that the sale at Christie's, we were talking in Ether, all these transactions are being made in cryptocurrency. They can be exchanged for real dollars, it's true, but we don't know to which extent it's being made. But there is more than money, and that is what I'm really interested into. And someone like Pac, and I just, you know, uh, mention uh, how he designed really his work and how it could potentially raise a really a whole lot of money. He's also very, you know, he, he has this uh, activist side. Most of these artists actually do. And he actually raised with Julian Assange uh, uh, 50 mil uh, 54 million for the WikiLeaks founders, you know, uh, to, to defend himself. So um, even if they're playing, you know, with, with, with this big market, if, if even if they're, they, they look look as if they're just looking for money, you can find through this kind of project the, the, the fact that they remain activists, they remain people who uh, want to, to change things. And yes, another example, which I really like too, the artist Grayson Earl with Bail Block. You know, uh, Grayson Earl, he, he's an activist. Um, he's the one who uh, uh, goes at night in front of the Guggenheim Museum and he, with a very high uh, resolution beamer, he projects uh, sentences on the, 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 the Guggenheim Museum saying like, here big art, low wages, you know, to denounce the fact that uh, in, in, in big museums there are lots of people being uh, underpaid while the, the board of administration, actually, they are all billionaires. And um, he designed this, this project called Bail Block. Actually, you, you, you download the, uh, the, the, the program on your computer, and the program is going to use a very small amount of your, um, of your computer to uh, produce a cryptocurrency. And that, well, exactly the same way it works with, with, uh, with Bitcoin, but of course we're not talking about the same, uh, the same power. And that cryptocurrency is being turned into US dollars, and these dollars are being used to help uh, people in jail pay for their, uh, their lawyer, and especially to pay for uh, the, the bail block, which, mean, which means that they can, you know, they can be out of jail uh, on parole waiting for their trial, because it's well known that the less they stay in prison, the less they, you know, they, they can fall into crime again. So it's really an activist uh, project that is working exactly the same way the, 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 the Bitcoin uh, blockchain actually works. But it's really to help people, uh, poor people in jail. And yes, another example, Simon Denny. Uh, this is a project that he did uh, for uh, Kunsthalle in, in, in Basel. Uh, he, t he, he created an NFT that is linked to a file that shows the historical house prices. And it, he shows you, the, the, you know, how the, the, the price of houses are raising and raising. And um, this is the NFT he sold. And by selling the NFT, the, the money he made by selling the NFT, he 
he gave 50% of it to the Kunsthalle Basel and 50% of it to the city of Basel. So maybe not the city or the museum that really needs the more money in the world, it's true, but anyway, the message is, Everything around cryptocurrency is a way to, uh, you know, uh, laundry money is a way to go around taxes and trying to, you know, uh, protect assets and everything. And he wants to take that money back and put it into the public system again. So once again, something very, you know, activist uh, uh, side. And yeah, uh, he, he was the one, just to parenthesis, but I really like this one too much, he was the one who uh, found out that Amazon was uh, design, designing a, a, a worker's cage. So there was really a worker's cage that would be you know, carried around Amazon's warehouses, and there was a patent, and he was the one who came out with the, you know, the, the, the discovery, and he actually created the worker's cage to see what it looks like. And Amazon said, oh yes, that's right, maybe not the best idea we had, but they actually designed it. Uh, another project which uh, brings us to the uh, what's 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 happening right now in in Ukraine is really interesting. Um, back to the blockchain. Uh, what is really important about the blockchain? Once it's in the blockchain, it cannot be changed. So uh, I heard this example of Donald Trump uh, declaring the war to China and sending it on Twitter. You know, uh, if one second later someone made a copy of that uh, tweet and send it on the blockchain, it's over. The CIA, the NSA, the FBI, they, there is nothing they can do to take it away from it. And uh, um, uh, a collective of uh, Ukrainian artists, what they did is that they, they created this website where they take every single tweet from the, the beginning of the uh, Russian invasion. So uh, really uh, minutes uh, to minutes, you know, hours from hours. This is the first time that Zelensky is talking and it, it goes on Twitter. And what they do is that they create a piece of art and they insert the tweet, the copy of the tweet within the artwork and it goes on the blockchain, it goes in the NFT, which means that it will live forever, which is really, uh, uh, from a, a metaphorical point of view, really interesting because it says, even though the Russians are you know, fooling uh, the, the people with fake news and, and saying, no, it did not happen, this did not happen, they know it happened. And thanks to the blockchain and thanks to the NFT and to crypto art, you know, it will remain there for, forever. So I think it's really important. Uh, all these artists you know, thinking about what they can do with NFT, what, what, what it means, what are the possibilities. Uh, Sarah Friend, a, a work that I really like too, it's an NFT, once again, it's on the blockchain, it's linked to a piece of digital art, but it's a life form. It's something that you need to take care of. You know? So if you don't take care uh, of your uh, NFT, actually it will be, re it will be deleted from your, your wallet. And what do you do to take care? Because you, you don't know what to do. And she explained, it's not a problem. It's a life form. It needs to move around. So you cannot keep it for more than 90 days. If you keep it more than 90 days, it's being deleted. So it's really interesting because, you know, it brings you to, uh, to the idea of what it is. You know, it needs to go around. You know, it's a currency. It needs to be exchanged. And she does it in a very poetical way, I think, life form. And she also displays it this way, like a sculpture with the, the, the iPhone and the life form that goes on. And it, it tells you how long it's going to live again if it's not, you know, being moved around to another place. And yes, Anna Riddler, it's, it's, it's a piece that I really like too. Um, you know, the, 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 everybody knows about the, the tulips in, in Holland in, in the 17th century, how it was the, you know, the first big bankruptcy, the first you know, economic uh, bubbles, the, 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 the evaluation of the, 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 the tulip industry. And actually what she designed, uh, within the, the NFT, you have the picture of a tulip, but it will remain only for one week slowly it blurs away and in the end you know it you, you, you cannot see it anymore so it's it also you, you you buy thing and you think you buy it forever because everybody tells you it's an nft will live on the blockchain forever it's true but actually what she designed the the the, the artwork that is linked to the nft it will change over time and uh, it reminded me of a an, an older artwork by David Clairbaut, uh, it, it goes back to uh, 2000, which is a small video that you could download on your computer and it will, for one week, show you a rose or a, a, another flower slowly uh, fading away and in the end you could send it to someone else, you could send the, 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 the seeds actually of the flower to someone else by email and it will start over again. And uh, yes, some last example, you know, of crazy things that people, uh, the artists can think about. Rhea Mayers that I mentioned before, 
okay, so she sold the NFT, she sold the, 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 the artwork, but there is no way to know what it is. Everything has been deleted, everything has been changed, you know, by small uh, emojis, by, you know, uh, uh, characters that she designed. So, yes, it's, it, it, it exists and she can show it to you on the blockchain, but there is no way to know what is linked to, you know, what is actually the, the, the piece. So, the only thing that remains is really the uh, NFT itself. And um, yes, one last example, Jonas Lund, a uh, very interesting artist because he's very interested into the connection between the economy, the big world of economy and, and art. Like he allows you to become part of the board of Jonas Lund if you want to invest into Jonas Lund, buy shares of Jonas Lund and you can decide with Jonas Lund what Jonas Lund should produce as art, you know. So if you are a collector and you like Jonas Lund art, well, it's, you know, maybe it's a good deal. And uh, he designed this uh, type of NFT, the owner of this NFT must donate, for instance, 5% of their uh, yearly profits to a charitable cause. And this is within the smart contract, which means that if you don't do it, you know, he has the right to delete the uh, uh, crypto asset from your wallet. So you, you see it can go really, really far into the, uh, the, the, the conception. So this is the last one I wanted to. So uh, 1997, the si simple net art diagram. It's a very, very important piece of art, really. Uh, 1997 is the, the first time, really, that there was an attempt to merge contemporary art with net art. And I think we have someone here who knows exactly what I'm talking about. Documenta 10, 1997. Net artists were invited to uh, uh, you know, present their work uh, with contemporary artists and, you know, was not that easy to do at the time. And uh, now we're moving to another step, I think. I think that, you know, more and more contemporary art and digital art are, are, are merging and maybe through this NFT concept uh, we are witnessing something. But I really think there are two things here. Uh, yes, you have artists or wannabe artists, you know, uh, sending their digital drawings or, or, or whatever, trying to make money out of everything just because the NFT is there, which I think is not the most interesting part. On the other hand, you have all these artists I just mentioned, and to me, they really come from the, the net art movement. You know, the internet arrived in the mid-90s, and as soon as the internet uh, came out, you had artists who decided to question the internet, what it meant to, to have something like the internet and uh, this is how it all started you know the very first pieces of net art they, they go back to the very first moment where we all had access to the internet and maybe maybe uh, we are witnessing the same with nft just like we had net artists we might have uh, uh, nft artists who uh, help us um, uh, think about what it means to have blockchain, what it means to have cryptocurrency, you know, uh, what, what it means for humanity. Let's not forget, it's really a big ecological issue too. That's really something to underline. The blockchain really uses a lot of energy. Uh, is it fair, you know, is it really a good idea? Maybe we, we you know, we, we should rethink it. And I think these NFT artists, maybe they can help us uh, think about it. Voila. Thank, thank you. you Hope it was not too long. No, thank you. I think it's, it's very interesting to, to, to see all these different concepts uh, that can be made within the blockchain and within the NFT. And, and my question goes directly to Joan, as you are one of the uh, net art pioneers. Uh, and, and Coming back to what you say uh, at the end, is, is it, do you think or do you see similarities of what's happening now with, with all this NFT movement and the net art movement uh, that you were like into it uh, at the beginning? And, and also we will sh probably show a work of where you're also criticizing uh, is it about criticizing or is it more about uh, finding new ways of communication? Uh. Yeah, that's a lot of questions yeah. at once. Uh, first, I shall start with the first one. You say, if I see any similarities about now and uh, 25 years ago, and I must say, no. <laughs> uh, 
The only similarity I see is that we are talking about a network. And that's, that's about it. I mean, uh, net art started uh, with the race of uh, the World Wide Web and basically the invention of a browser. I mean, before you had BBSs, you had mail art, you had whatever digital art made on local computers and with uh, websites suddenly you could reach the whole world. And instead of narrowing it down to ownership, it was a, it was a lot more about communication. Yeah, because here you see that NFTs is more about ownership. So we, we have like some, it's something different. No, no, absolutely. That's why I'm interested into the artists who, who, who question the very nature of ownership and say, okay, what it means. You know, maybe it's not the most interesting thing. But yes, of course, I, I totally agree with you. And how, how do you deal, Joanne, now with, with uh, NFTs? Because I know that you, you made like a work of yeah. NFT. So I think most easy is to show yeah. it. Then I can explain it. Uh, first of all, so yeah. This is a work I made, and it's it's called Chameleon. And yeah, uh, there are 256 NFTs. Uh, yeah, under it, every basically you you have the blockchain, and the blockchain is a lot about cryptocurrency and and. and crypto assets, which is about money. So if you want to own something, you need a wallet. And a wallet, you, gen uh, you generate basically with 12 words. They got encrypted in this uh, kind of uh, abstract number, which you can reduce to, to yeah, you saw it uh, in the previous talk, you saw a lot of, uh, coming by of these wallet numbers. Uh, the thing is that this wallet number could, could be transferred to, let's say, sound, uh, colors. So the colors you see is specific to the wallet number of the owner. Uh, once they were sold, it, there, there was a chance of a dice that you would have a, uh, the logo of game over on it. So this this website actually shows you how many times these NFTs are traded. So the 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 you bigger the border, so in the end the are, are they really sold with cryptos? Or hmm? Are they sold or are they just giving to someone else? You you sell them. Yeah, these are sold. Yeah, these are sold. In, yeah, and they, they live on the Ethereum blo blockchain. And a lot of these NFTs are actually traded just uh, as, you, as you scroll over these, you see that very few are like, like collectors, they keep hold on their asset. So you don't even have to say you have to trade it because that's a bit of the business of a lot of NFTs that they got traded and traded for profit. Uh, so you still play with, uh, uh, yeah, with the networks and, and criticizing mm -hmm. uh, like NetArt did in, uh, at that time to, or, to, to, or more to see the possibilities. Uh, of what can uh, a network do for no, us? No, it's, it's a system. I mean, NFTs are a system, and I made a system on top of it, which uh, I think the whole world, uh, the, the word NFT me means literally non-fungible token. Uh, why should a token not be fungible? Why should it not be changed all the time? So a lot of uh, it, it actually leads to, to a kind of static uh, world, static art. And I think in digital art, we are f way further 
to make more complex things, but in a way the blockchain is still limited, the contracts are still limited. Uh, so... Yeah, you still need yeah. a, quite a lot of development, especially with these smart contracts, mm -hmm. uh, because it's quite complex to make these contracts. Uh, it's, uh, it's Web3 coding. Uh, so... I think it will evolve with the time, people are working on it. But what, what I mean, we have not a talk about ownership and, and smart contracts, but what I find important for the artist is that the smart contract is on the name of the artist and not on the marketplace name. Uh, and that's what's happening uh, mostly uh, today. Um, yeah, maybe it has a future. I don't say it doesn't have a future. I think first uh, there needs to be at least another system that it's, uh, it, which of course is promised. And uh, then there, the yeah, if you talk about ownership, I mean, I said websites could be sold as as well, so so that shouldn't be a reason to make an NFT. But do you to do we need to own everything? Huh? Yeah, that's the no, we don't. No, we don't need it. Eh? I'm not a no. collector, so I, I can't know. judge for people who are eager to collect. But it's it, it's still very limited, and you don't know if it. Uh, it will stay forever and how the upgrades go because you saw some smart contracts coming by with a number and they're all already new smart contracts and i know from making websites i uh they don't if you pay the domain name okay they're there forever but uh, our hardware and systems are constantly evolving so if there isn't a system that you can actually update your work, which you do with a website, it will be a kind of a ruin in a couple of years. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> so I don't know, you as a curator, uh, you want to add something? You, you wrote also about that art, uh, you, you, you know the, the movement, you, you follow up also the movement of NFTs. Um, okay, we, we can talk about a lot, but you as a, as a curator who, who, who saw the presentation of, of Perive and, and all these artists actually playing a bit like what you did uh, with NetArt, you play with, with all the possibility, technical possibilities, uh, Artists playing with uh, with the contracts, uh, making uh, so it, it, for me it's, there is also like a, it's very serious but also playful. Um, no, I just wanted to have you you your point of view of everything as more as a creator point of view. Yeah, I would I would uh, bring in also more historic view, which is also what I've what I've worked on to understand how we got here. Uh, if we look at the last 20 plus years of uh, this development, we have, uh, on the one hand, we have uh, one, one main problem, which is the separation between digital art and contemporary art, and how artists have longed to be part of the contemporary art world and the contemporary art market. Now, the contemporary art market has paid attention to digital art in several moments over these last 20 years. And uh, these uh, moments have also been connected to economical moments. So in the, in the late 90s, beginning uh, of the 2000s, we have the dot-com boom. And at that moment, also with all the excitement of the millennium, etc., we have a lot of interest for net art and what can happen online. So you have, for instance, the Guggenheim started a net art collection. There was a lot of attention to that. Uh, Sotheby's started playing with the idea of, of having online auctions, eBay too. Then that burst, uh, Sotheby's lost a lot of money. The first uh, platforms trying to sell digital editions also lost money. And then that kind of went down. 
But at that moment, it was also the moment where the most veteran art galleries like Bitforms, Dam, or Postmasters were already working and were already supporting digital art. But that started to continue like more on the, on the background and still separate. Then we have another economical uh, situation, which is 2007, 2009, the Great Recession, the, the global um, economic crisis. And then the art market realizes that, particularly in the US, there is a recession, but then in Asia, the, the economy is growing. So they say, we have to look for other markets. How do we do it? Well, that's this thing called the internet. We can start selling things online. We can reach other markets besides big galleries setting shop in Beijing or whatever, all right? So in that moment, and, and we're uh, beginning 2000s, we start to have things like the VIP art fair, which was uh, marketed as the first fully online art fair. We have uh, sedition selling digital editions. We have um, <coughs> RC creating this kind of uh, Amazon for, uh, for galleries. Uh, and we have, which I think is also interesting, uh, the uh, auction house Philips, which launched uh, this company called Paddle 8, that started to make online auctions. And the funny thing is because online auctions are very uh, cheap, you don't have to, to move the, the artworks, you can make them very quick. They say, why not try something new? And they did three auctions with digital art, with artists that had not been in the market and they were suddenly pushed into auction. And uh, that was very much publicized. The artist more or less sold. It was not super big success, but it was already like paying attention to that. And I think that's the moment that the big auction houses, Sotheby's and Christie's, started to pay attention to, hey, there's this digital art that can be sold uh, at auction. And then uh, we have in the last 10 years, we have all this uh, platforms developing, trying to find new ways of selling art online. We also have this thing that has been very much discussed, which is the financialization of art, with more and more people from the financial markets entering the art market and bringing in their, their know-how and, and their, their way of understanding things, which is paired with the growing ability to uh, manipulate or analyze better data. So there's more and more data analysis, there's more and more approach to art that can be analyzed and analyzing the careers of artists and see where they go and how I can invest. All this comes together with the big auction houses realizing they don't have that many Warhols to sell and that digital art can be this new thing that can be sold for very high prices. Already 2008, 2018, sorry, they try this with uh, artificial intelligence art and they make these big, this big sales. That went well for a little bit moment but then we reach to this uh, final years where we have the, the growing uh, cryptocurrency market, we have the e-commerce market which is already established, and then the auction houses already looking for this digital art. That is uh, paired also with all the artists that have been uh, working in the digital art field, not making much money, not getting much of the attention from the, the contemporary world, be, even though that was growing. And then it's when we reach to these sales that Pierre was showing us, where suddenly someone nobody knows in the art market, nobody knows in the digital art world, goes and sells for a tremendous amount of money. You know? So that, I think, uh, it was the, 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 this, this kind of fuse that, that blew, and that kind of made realize all the artists that would, would have been working in the digital art field, someone who's doing something uh, particularly Beeple, which in my opinion, he's doing something that many people can do. Many people who can work with 3D can do. At least technically, it's not that, that complicated. So a lot of people were saying, this guy is selling for millions, I can do it too. And the auction houses, of course, their objective is to sell at the highest price. It's not to create something or to follow the career of an artist, it's to make big sales. And I think all these things put together have led us to the moment we are, you know? So we have these three uh, big moments and now we're in this third moment of attention. So I think the most important thing right now, so the whole thing doesn't blow up, is that we can go beyond the hype and that we can really talk about uh, also uh, what, what you said that uh, NFT is just a register, 
there is an artwork behind it, there is an artwork, and we have to f uh, focus on the artwork and on the quality of what is being sold. And, and go beyond all, all, this, all this hype and all this uh, thing to kind of reach to a point where this is more stable and we are actually talking about the art, art that anyone can, can buy, that's good. Also, we can talk about art that is not so expensive, which is also something uh, that we really should be focusing on. And, and, and really go into this new situation that we have been uh, waiting for for more than 20 years, where finally digital art is part of contemporary art and is part of, uh, yeah, the, the types of creativity that speak about the, the times we live right now. Uh, but artists know for a long time, since Fluxus, that they can sell anything they want. And also digital artists know they can sell anything they want. So they don't have to be worried about any market. But they are. Some artists are, but most artists know they can sell anything. I mean, they can jump in the air and it can be sold. If you have, ha have a conceptual contract or you're a Fluxus artist, you can, you can sell anything you want. Also, within this hype and, 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 uh, and uh, press, uh, TV, radio, TV, Playing with this hype, uh, as you said, the hype is over. Um, and and now I think it's an, an a really interesting moment to 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 and also for artists and and curators and and, and art art critici to to educate the people um, and and to show them the good way we, we can really change things. It's a decentralized system. We are not anymore in a centralized system. And, and what I feel and what I have around me is that we have much more, it's like a revival of something. I don't know what's happening, but it's something new coming. And this something new coming is maybe just the blockchain in general. And uh, we were talking uh, before the, the, the talk, it's not about. It's not only about art. It's about our society. How we're going to change everything. That we will have less intermediaries. Uh, and coming back to the to the to the art fair or the art world, um, all the galleries. Okay, uh, I, t I think we still will need people to to um, to help the artist to find a way uh, into all this uh, communication, because today if you want to sell, you have to do communication. Because what you need today, if someone wants to sell something, or you are a good gallery and you have like a database of good collectors, uh, or you are a good com uh, community manager. I hope there'll be a little more than community <laughs> managers, really. But there is one thing that is really important. Yes, it's it, it's the blockchain. What I'm interested into with these uh, crypto art and NFTs is really they, they they force us to look at the blockchain and whatever we do. The, the the blockchain is a technology that will remain. I don't know what it's going to turn into. I don't know what we're going to use it. Too, but I, I really think that these artists, and I'm talking the artists we, I, I mentioned today, I'm not really, even, yes, even somehow people if you want to, you know, even, even people is, is forcing us to look at the blockchain and is forcing us to look at cryptocurrency because we don't know if actually the, the, the buyer of the, the artwork really is the buyer. We don't know if it was not resold some, you know, another way. We don't know if when an artwork goes from 100 to 10,000 to 10 million dollars, stepping from one owner to the other, the three owners are not the, the same person. We don't know it. And uh, I, I, I think that all this frenzy uh, around the NFT f forces us to think about it. Just like net art, actually, when it came, forces us to, to think about what the internet was. And I remember the, the first work by Jody that I saw on my computer and clicking on one window would suddenly spread all your screen with, you know, 
dozens of windows that you didn't know how to, 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 to close. It was really scary because this was the time when we were talking about computer viruses, you know, we were talking about the, you know, the big crash of the year 2000 when all computers were going to shut down. It was the end of the world, you know, and uh, <laughs> it was crazy. And th these pieces of net art from there the There are also already NFT viruses, if you're worried. Sorry? Uh, already yeah, NFT and viruses. Fire. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yes, they are, definitely. And um, so this is why I was talking about NFT art. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to, to see a new generation of artists that make us think about the, the blockchain because when I try to understand the blockchain, I always go back to this interview between Edward Snowden and his lawyer. You know, I really recommend it. You, you, you search Snowden lawyer and uh, blockchain, and he explains it very, you know, is, and he knows what he's talking about. And yes, he underlines, he's, he's, he talks about cryptocurrency, and he says, well, no, this is not what I'm interested in, too. But he really underlines what the, the blockchain can be useful for, you know, and this way to fight against fake news, this way to, to it, it can be really useful. And I, well, I don't know, maybe I'm too optimistic, maybe I'm a bit naive, but I still think that the artists help us think about the contemporary world we live in, you know. Pao, last word, uh, before we give yeah. the word to the people, well, to the I, audience. I, I think we have to, uh, I, I agree with you, but I think we have to realize that there's a lot of noise right now. It's not the same moment as net art. I mean, there were very few people looking at that, and I think the idea was different. Right now, we have um, a scene that is dominated by the market. It's market-oriented, and it's dominated also by the structure of an auction. And an auction is putting a, a lot at the highest price possible and selling quick, creating a lot of hype around that object for it to sell and then go for the next and the next. That's how auctions work. It's part of the art market, but it shouldn't be all the market. So that's why I fear that if this becomes a bubble, there will be uh, uh, a lot of people then disappointed, and then we will go into a valley. We will go into a moment where nobody wants to hear about NFTs, nobody wants to hear about digital art, because we also have this problem. If someone buys a painting and they don't like it, they don't blame all the painters. If someone buys digital art and they don't like it, they think all digital art is bad. And now we, we are on the same train with NFTs with that. So we, we, might, we might go down the cliff if we don't kind of set up something that makes sense. That's my Yeah, I don't, I don't think all NFTs are bad, but there is a big difference between a, a previous digital art or previous art is that directly the, uh, the crypto price is next to the artwork. And that makes a huge difference. I mean, if you see that, okay, that's a thousand and that's a million. So you don't look at the work uh, like without a price attached to it. There is no way on the blockchain to, I mean, on the one hand you can say, okay, it's, it's great, it's open, but you, there, there's this danger that you only judge works by the price. Yeah, but I don't think all NFTs are bad. I just think 90% of NFTs are bad, which is like saying 90% of YouTube videos are bad. The 10% that's left is a lot of our work that is very good. You know, so there's a lot. The, the problem is there's a lot of production and there is a lot going on. That's, that's what I'm, I was heading yeah. to. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think it's also important to give the, the audience the word and, and ask us some questions. So I will give my mic, oh, there is a mic there that can go into the public. So just raise your hand um, and don't be shy. There is, some, there is someone there. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, ah, yes, I was behind the, the column, so you couldn't see me. So um, I just wanted to point, uh, I'm sorry, her name. Um, Joanne. Th th her name, I don't know her name. Joanne. 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 Yes, uh, that there are, you know, 
some marketplaces that are trying to go around this uh, question that you mentioned, that the artwork comes with the tag, you know, the price tag. So some marketplaces, uh, I can t mention two of them, have no price whatsoever when you see the art. Uh, and then you have to enter the profile of the, of the so, so you have to look for the price. But the first impression, and that's really uh, very important for the developers doing those kind of uh, marketplaces, is really to try to, to, to make the work, uh, the, the first impression that you have is really the art, and not the price tag, because that's a, that's a lot uh, around that issue, you know, that, you know, that, that becomes, you know, that the art just becomes a, a price tag, and that it's all about what, most marketplaces, what's really in front is uh, the art that is selling more. So that's giving the, the, the importance to that and not to anything else. So, yeah, so there are some, some works like that. And uh, so I am uh, active in Tezos, the, the Tezos blockchain, which is uh, like an independent uh, small brother, uh, kind of the black sheep of the whole thing. Um, and I'm seeing there this uh, very sad tendency to get already disappointed because the PFP entered this space, which was um, one year ago, it was blooming with uh, independent uh, digital artists doing one-on-one -on -one pieces or uh, small edition pieces. And then <coughs> PFP came and then object.com, which is like a bigger marketplace, uh, was set up. And now we see this movement of artists uh, dropping out uh, or feeling quite disappointed because when you see at uh, the, the front page of the marketplace what's selling is uh, stupid skulls blinking or uh, dogs, animated dogs uh, with utilities and all this stuff that we really don't care or understand. And so what I see is this problem of how to bring more uh, collectors into the space. Because what happened in Tezos, which is really beautiful, is this circular um, kind of uh, uh, market that artists were buying from other artists. But uh, that's not enough, you know, it's not enough for us. Uh, we are starting to get uh, strangled by the amount of artists who are entering and which are not necessarily, uh, and, and the money flow is going to this PFP stuff. So it's getting more and more hard because more artists are entering and uh, are, the collectors are coming, but they are looking at PFPs or they're coming from Ethereum, interested in PFPs. There are projects that are entering Tezos and they are trying to make the quick buck. And then when I talk to real collectors in real life, they're all like, oh yeah, but we look at NFT and it's just, uh, you know, crypto punks or, or lasers or dogs or whatever. So how to... So, sorry, coming to my question, how yes. to bring the fucking collectors, you know, how to talk to, yeah. how no. to talk to people so they see that there's so much good art happening. Actually, I started with zero crypto. I, I just asked uh, some people and just enough to, to mint, uh, to put my stuff there and... Uh, that's it, because I, I, I tried, I just refused to, 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 to buy uh, any crypto, not even te Tezos. Um, how to get more collectors? I don't know. First, make better exhibitions, in the sense that I was asked for Tezos Miami Basel, uh, I think this year or last year. And I said, okay, I want to show my work, but it needs to be shown on a computer because it was a time-based piece and it was changing, evolving over time. So a bit like the other piece you saw, it, it would be different uh, at nine in the morning than at noon, etc., etc. But for them, it was too difficult to put a computer in the space. And how ideal Tezos is, I mean, if you look at the people who make Tezos and who made the show, I mean, these were just highly, uh, yeah, some investor people. So don't think Tezos is the saint. Uh, how to get more collectors? I'm, I'm not a collector. I don't collect. I, I only sometimes get some gifts. So I'm not the person to ask. But I think that 
the main problem is for most co collectors who are interested in works and are not from uh, any crypto um, background is how do we get that crypto? I think that's the basic question. That's, that's what we, we, we encounter at, the, at, uh, at Brussels Fair. Like, um, okay, we don't have cryptos. So what's happening is that you have today systems where you can just pay in, uh, in fiat with a credit card. And it's automatically changed into cryptos. So this is quite, it's, it's evolving every month. And, and, and collectors, uh, you will do, you have to do like a good art. And if, if the art is, is okay, you will find someone to buy it or someone to show it. it, it nothing is changing into uh, the side of the, of the business. But we will go to other people because we have only like 10 minutes left. Good afternoon and congratulations to the speakers and the organizers. I am Carolina Fernandez Castrillo from Spain. I am curator at the Venice Center for Digital and Public Humanities and professor at Universidad Carlos III de Madrid. And my question is more related to the conceptual side from what you have said. And I am specifically interested in two concepts. Uh, how do you see in this third decade of the 21st century related to the NFTs, everything you have mentioned? which is the current situation and how is going to be the next future related to the concept of inter-creativity, how users are going to be part of the creative process, how they can join this universe you have mentioned before, and also this evolution from the concept of, of the aura, uh, this concept from Walter Benjamin, the aura, the erratic experience, like it's something special, unique, authentic, um, well, there is a revolution in that sense from the NFT world, everything changed. So I am very curious to know which are, well, your ideas on that. How do you figure out is going to be the future, the present, related to these two concepts? On one side, the, the presence of the user in the process, the creative process, and, and also this, this new way of conceiving the art world from mm. this idea of the uniqueness, uh, the present, how is this evolution? Thank you very much. Well, <laughs> um, maybe I'm, as, a, as a museum conservator, I'm really interested in uh, the question of uniqueness, that's for sure. Um, and w w when I when I when I look when I when I see all these uh, friends here, you know, about collecting something that you actually don't really really own, it raises a lot of question. Um, uh, what I think would be would be interesting maybe is to uh, consider that when you buy an NFT, uh, it's not uniqueness that you're looking for, but actually you're supporting something. You're supporting uh, creativity. You're supporting artists, and I think that it's something that is not really being underline um, so instead of thinking yes it's okay you 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 own the nft but then again the file can be copied um, multi you know whatever no ju just think of it as a, as a way to, to to support creativity and 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 maybe the artist himself or herself uh, would like to to produce something that would maybe bring back this concept of uniqueness. You know, uh, it doesn't have to be uh, only digital files that you can copy or you know or, or multiply. Maybe with the help of selling these NFTs, of bringing you know of raising support from collectors, then you can go back to something. And I hear about it. I hear more and more about. Uh, this, this, this idea of oh yes okay you you buy the NFT and of course you get you you get access to the file but you also get you know a physical artwork this is why I mentioned you know Kevin Abosch and 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 Ai Weiwei but younger artists from this you know new generation they are thinking about it too so maybe this whole virtual thing and not owning it doesn't really meet its market. And I, I watched the video again of uh, uh, Kevin McCoy and, uh, and, and Ildash before coming here. There is a question in the you know, in audience saying that, 
who's going to buy this? You know, <laughs> they just created the first NFT crypto art related, and there's someone who's going to buy this. And they say this, they say, just wait until the market is ready. And to, to come back to what Paul said, yes, the, the market was ready because you also have a new generation of buyers. Christie's, Christie said that the buyers for the auction of people were mostly under 40, even under 30 years old, and that most of them had never been to an auction at Christie's before. So, you know, there, there is this, uh, this important side too. So, um, I think we're witnessing uh, something is happening, but it might change. And I think that beyond what I say, the conceptual, the conceptual side that I find really interesting, uh, forcing us to think about the change in society and contemporary artwork with the blockchain and everything. People in the end will like to have a unique, a truly unique piece of work, I think. And, you know, both things, they can, they can live together. That's my, my opinion, but I, I don't know. Yeah, it's it's not only a digital file you can put uh, on an NFT. You, there, yeah, there. You, you're talking about yeah. You, you you can put several things on it because it's a contract. You you can put in real life. You can organize things uh, together. So you're talking about user experience, and uh, I think. That really depends on the work. Like some, some users will just experience it on their phone. It, it, uh, if you put a music uh, file on an NFT, then you probably will put it on your sound system. If you have a, a, yeah, a digital feedback, you probably will print it out or something like that. I think the user experience will be, uh, yeah, ha has a really wide variety of uh, how you in interpret it, and that has to do, uh, yeah, with the nature of what is glued to that NFT. I would, I would like, uh, since you mentioned Benjamin, I would go straight to Benjamin. I think that, well, Benjamin, as you know, he said, of course, that the, the mechanical reproduction of the artwork eliminates the aura. But he also said that it frees the artwork from the parasitic dependence on a ritual and that it can lead to the artwork becoming an image to be reproduced, which I think is very interesting. And that's actually something that digital art can do. It doesn't have to be within the ritual of the exhibition, of the museum, of the gallery. It can be anywhere. And that is actually what is happening. So for instance, in the, in the, in the company I work in, in NEO, what we are about is uh, taking the artworks to a dedicated screen, that you have a screen at home, and you can see the artworks there. Artworks that you buy or artworks that you access through a subscription, doesn't matter. The idea is that you have a space where you experience art. Because the unique thing that you have in the end is your experience of the art. The art can be reproduced no matter how many times, but the unique thing is what you get from it and the art that you choose and what you learn from that. So I, I think that's still there and we don't have to focus on the object. We have to focus on what we get from it. Yes, and, and, and one doesn't play against the other. I just a word about the, the show I'm curating right now at the museum. You're all very invited to come and see it, of course, which is around the death of Maha by Jacques-Louis uh, Jacques David. And I curated this part of the show uh, where you have contemporary uh, interpretation of the, the painting by David. And there is one that I really like, which is a, a video portrait by uh, Robert Wilson, by Bob Wilson that was designed for uh, the Louvre Museum in 2013. And it's uh, Lady Gaga playing uh, Maha. So you have Lady Gaga in the bathtub, you know, um, dying, but she, her eyes blinking somehow. It's beautiful, the music is beautiful, the, the sound is beautiful. And we designed the setting in close collaboration with the, the Robert Wilson studio. And we, we, we bought a screen, especially for the, you know, to, to display the work, to, to display the file. And the file was put on a media player and the first one did not match. And then they work a lot, you know, to, in, to, you know, to do coding and everything. So very complex video. And it's a full, full high HD, 4K screen, two meters high. You know, it's a beautiful room. It's really an experience. 
and 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 it's actually the first NFT that Robert Wilson produced. <laughs> so so we show it, and actually what he did just one year ago is to produce an NFT and to link this NFT to this video, as you say that you can now watch on your on your iPhone. So. Yes, there are two ways to, to, to watch it at home, on your screen, on your iPhone, or you come to the museum and you share it in a physical space with other people and you feel it and, you know, you experience it another way. We have time for two short questions and then we go to the next uh, talk. But short questions, not uh, half. And, yeah. I'll try and to we'll stay as short as possible. We'll do uh, Frédéric. <laughs> So Short one, eh? yeah. So where does the value lie in NFTs, like like monetary or creatively? But like, where does the value actually lie? Is it in the ownership? Is it in the art? Or is it in the code? I think the, I think uh, I will I will answer for everyone. I think the value is about what you uh, think the value is for the artwork. It's about passion. If you if you buy art, it's about passion. So the value. If you want to invest into, it's, it's two different things. Or you collect uh, as a, a, someone who likes art and, uh, and passion, or you, you buy as investor. It's two different uh, things. No, but you can have value in art and like mastery and like years of experience or like creative originality, but in NFTs that are partially randomly generated or that are like replicable infinitely or that are a th series of 10,000s, like what are the new ways to assess value in, in like this new digital age? I, I think we, we cannot um, see it the way we, we perceive the rest of the contemporary art market. It's a total new generation. And I think that the value they give to it is also to be part of a community. This is became, becoming more and more obvious uh, in, in such a way that even now if you own, let's say, a CryptoPunk, uh, you have uh, CryptoPunk owners who get together in real life, which means that you can be part of the, the, the trip or you can be part of the party if you own a CryptoPunk. So suddenly, what was just you know a bunch of geeks uh, collecting uh, uh, 24 per 24 pixel uh, uh, images? Um, yeah, they, they become part of, of of something, and maybe that's the, the I don't know. Maybe it's the true value that they're they're looking for to be part of something that is so very different from what their parents or great parents may have done by buying artworks. You know, maybe I but, don't know. But can that be abused? Because you were talking about the fact of having like it's basically pay to be joined to join the club. Yes. And in the same way as like that artist, the artist that had the living work that can be tra and needs to be transferred every ninety days. What would stop something like that to just be three investors or the same investor, like just ramping up the value of it and in the same time just paying royalties on resale to the artist on every sale? That would be a deal. <laughs> that would be a great deal. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, I would say. Uh, a collector gets three types of capital from an artwork. They get cultural capital, what you learn from the artwork, social capital, the um, respect you get from others by owning a good collection, and economic capital when you resell it. So every artwork has a combination of those. And every collector can choose when they buy which type of capital they are most interested in or with what, what are they taking. So value is all of that to me. Frédéric? And last one. Uh, which NFT did you buy and uh, do you like the most for all four? I didn't buy any. I'm not planning to buy any. <laughs> I, like Joan, when this thing started, I someone lent me one Tethos. I, I made a few NFTs. I sold them and when, when, where, I, where I got, I started buying NFTs. Uh, or everything on the Tethos blockchain. The last uh, NFT I bought, which I'm very, very happy with, is an animation by Patrick Tresset, which is absolutely beautiful. Uh, I was not able to even get the cryptocurrency because my bank does not let me buy cryptocurrency, so I had to kind of ask a, a friend to buy it for me and then pay him, and uh, it was worth it. I really, love, I really love that work. I have it in my screen and I see it every day. 
the train. Uh, it's a train animation. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really fantastic. Something to look at every day and think about travel and think about the drawing, the process behind it. It's really fantastic. You, you, uh, now you have like a lot of cryptos. What are you going to do with that? <laughs> First, uh, no, I don't have a lot of cryptos, and I'm not interested in a lot of cryptos. And I received about two thesis from Patrick Tresset, from Alteren, also artist, and uh, I bought 35 artworks on object. Voilà. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.